Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Is it just me or is the Earth spinning faster on its axis at the moment, making time go even quicker? Or am I just getting old? (laughs) <laughs> Stop the world, I want to get off. Well, I say all this because I've just discovered that it's been three years since I last spoke to the Nasuni founder and CTO, Andre Rodriguez, and it blew me away. It felt like only yesterday I was speaking to him, and I remember him being an incredibly cool guy. He was also the CTO at the New York Times when it first launched its web presence and had a great story. But today... He's returning back to the podcast to talk about why ransomware has finally pushed back up to the breaking point. And we're going to discuss how, as ransomware attacks continue, traditional backups will be more widely exposed as completely inadequate for business continuity and minimising disruption to the business. So buckle up. And hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to the US, where he's waiting to speak with us and have a good old-fashioned catch-up too. So, a massive warm welcome back to the show. We last spoke in 2019, I can't believe that, but can you remind the listeners of who you are and what you do? Because I think we're going to have a few more people listening now since since our last conversation. Hi, Neil. Sure thing. It's great to talk to you again. Great to be back in your show. So, I am the founder and the Chief Technology Officer at Nasuni. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. Uh, This is my fifth startup. Um, I used to be a physicist, um, distributed systems guy. So I'm a technology, I come from the technology side. Um, And I like working on really big problems that need scale solutions. So here I am. Awesome. And this reminded me when I saw you were coming back on the podcast, I remember the last time we spoke, we talked at length about your success in your career. But I want to take you back even further this time to the very beginning and ask you to share your origin story. Can you remember where that passion for tech came from, what lit the spark and how you went from physicist to New York Times and uh, and the tech industry where you are now? Well, you know, it- I never... It- I can't imagine a, a, a time in my life when there wasn't technology all around me. But, you know, my dad was a, is an electrical engineer and he ran the phone company, Venezuela, where I'm from. So, you know, at our house, it was always technology. It was always building radios, building models, building computers later on. And that's all we ever talked about. All, all you know, we never talked about sports. We never talked about a little bit about politics, but not much really. What we did talk about was, you know, technology and its potential to change things. And, you know, whether it was my dad, you know, setting up communication towers and talking to us about data and how the telephone companies were changing into data companies when, you know, cell phones started coming, uh, coming about, you know, that whole change. Uh, And then computers, of course, computers was the, the most massive one. So, you know, by the time I, by the time I got to college, to study engineering, I had already been programming for 10 years and thinking about computers and software for a very long time. Um, and it's, you know, it's been my passion my whole life. I, I, I always thought, unlike my dad, I wasn't very good at the hardware part, at the actually tinkering with things where, you know, a little screw would fall like <laughs> five levels down and you couldn't grab it. But I did have a lot of patience with software and with just getting things to run the right way. Uh, and I was lucky enough to you know we born in a time when you know, a twelve year old boy could have his own computer. So that was that was really good. Yeah, it was an incredibly cool time. And and of course, for people that didn't hear our first conversation, you went on to become the CTO at the New York Times in your career, and and now the CTO at Nasuni, but. For for me, on the outside here, both companies are in completely different industries. But I'm curious, do they have more in common from a tech point of view than many people listening might think? Oh yes, uh, yes. And and you know the 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 New York Times was a formative experience for me because for the first time I saw what IT looked like. And you know before that, I've been in grad school and it was really like you get a lot of smart people that are all underpaid and you ask them to solve problems that you have no budget to solve, but these people will solve it for you. 
<laughs> and so there's a lot of creative thinking and there's a lot of, you know, it was a great time to be in school because distributed systems were, we just had enough technology back then to start forming systems that look very much like the cloud looks today, you know, networks, ethernet, you know, commo not commodity quality, you know, there were some workstations, but, you know, cheap enough computers compared to like massive mainframes or, you know, parallel machines. Uh, and we could see firsthand what you could do, but it was all science, you know, it was all R&D type stuff. When I go to the Times, I realized that they had some of the same scale problems, not quite to the same scale, but they were heading in that direction. And, you know, I think you and I may have talked last time that, you know, one of the problems the Times was having at the time was um, the web servers were just getting crushed with internet traffic, as mm -hmm. simple as that. And I was lucky enough to know a bunch of people from Akamai um, that had built, you know, what, what then became the CDN, you know, the content distribution network, one of the first cloud infrastructures out there. And we partnered, we put our whole site uh, on Akamai and it was magic. Like overnight, all the scale problems that none of my predecessors had been able to solve there were solved. And so I, you know, sort of very quickly realized this is, this is transformative. This will happen across the board to every single organization, especially if you, I mean, if you were in media, it was, it was obvious that Lots of files, big files, everything was going to be digital. And you had this traffic of all of a sudden half your media company was exposed to the outside world and millions of people could come to your site and expect that high performance and the sites to be available and all this stuff. And so it was very exciting. You know, it was, I mean, the only thing that is as exciting as that um, in the last two decades I think it's the whole transformation to software and the rise of the cloud, which if you're a software person is, is incredible because for the first time, there are no limits. The limit is really what kind of software can you write to scale to that enormous, elastic, someone else is running an infrastructure. Um, and what kind of problems can you solve if you attack it uh, thinking that way? So the world has become... You know, Andreessen said that software is eating the world. The world has become essentially a software canvas where you can draw anything you want and someone else is going to take care of running it for you, which always was a very difficult part. Even when we started Masuni, it was a difficult part of how we had to think about the problem. I think now we are, we are in a different world. We're in a much more abstract world and pure software world. Um, you know, all the hardware dependencies, unless you're, talking about you know embedded systems guys and you know running a controller in your electric bicycle you're really just talking software now you really are and of course on the flip side of that is the added vulnerability that that can give as well and i would say one challenge in both industries at the moment in fact every industry is ransomware and that's yeah. one of the reasons i invited you up back on the podcast today so can you tell me more about how it has finally been pushed back up to breaking point especially at a time when there's just so much uncertainty in the world, isn't there right now? I'll tell you a story. When, when, you know, we had, as any media company, even back at the times, we had very large file servers. Mm -hmm. um, and they were getting bigger. And one of the things that always concerned me was the, the backups. Specifically, the backups for file servers tend to be cumbersome and unreliable. And it's because the file servers are so big. You know, if you have a, if you have a two terabyte database, is, that's easy to back up. But if you have a 200 terabyte or a petabyte size file server, now it's, it's a world of hurt to mm -hmm. keep up um, with those backups. I mean, even if you're doing incrementals, if you have that much data, you're probably growing the data by tens of terabytes every day and your backup windows start becoming too long and to complete, say, overnight. And so you start getting into this issue where you have to start breaking down your data so that you can paralyze the backups and all this stuff. And then when you have to recover, um, there's, the backups are so big, it takes so long to recover that you hardly ever test the backups completely. And so when one day you go to those backups because you need them, you may find out that the backups for some reason, you know, access control, you know, compatibility with the formats and the release versions because the backups are old, you cannot use them anymore and you know as i thought about that problem i thought so i used to always tell my teams forget 
forget relying on the backup. I want you to do an extra full copy of the file system, stick it in a cheaper sort of file server somewhere, and let's keep that thing synchronized always with the master because I want to be able to go back to that. And we, you know, we of course had snapshots too in the primary race, but we would do periodic, like weekly and so on, to another file server. Um, I started the SUNY out of a lot of that frustration. You know, I had a, I, I wanted to solve the problem of how you built a really large file server without ever having to worry about capacity. So no formatting, nothing that files, you know, you can put a billion files and a petabyte size file system and not worry about it. But more importantly, I wanted to have it without backup. I wanted, I wanted the file system to protect itself, the versioning, the snapshot mechanism to be baked into the design of the file system so that you didn't have to rely on backup to do it. And when we first launched the company you know, 10 plus years ago, our value proposition to customers was, look, you don't have to do backups. Isn't that great? You don't have to worry about the backups. You don't have to worry about the backups working when you recover. Um, and you don't have to worry about the backup windows becoming longer and longer as these file servers are growing. Um, the thing that ransomware has changed is that the recovery time from backup, it's all predicated on the same thing. If you're not recovering from snapshot, but you're actually going, you need to go to your backups. And this is the very weakness in, in storage and data management practices that the ransomware hackers are targeting. Um, if, you, if you are encrypting files quietly in the background and you get out of the snapshot window, which for most companies, is three days to a week. You know, no one keeps snapshots in a regular, you know, traditional array for longer than that. Um, then what happens is all of a sudden, day 10, you realize you've been hit by ransomware. And at that point, you know, millions of files are encrypted. It could be dozens of file servers are compromised. And you're looking at a recovery task where the time it takes you to pull back from the backup is in the days to weeks time because so much has been compromised. And this, by the way, you know, has nothing to do with the backup, the specific backup technology. You know, you could have the best, the oldest backup technologies or the newest, latest, sexiest backup technologies. They all have the same problem because it has nothing to do with the backup. It has to do with the backup process, mm -hmm. right? It has to do with the fact that you're, you're copying those files from a backup source back to your file servers to bring those file servers back in production. Now, meantime, your entire ERP system, which relies on those file servers, your end users that are doing work, they're all just waiting. They're waiting for those copy, that copy back operation from backup to, to work. And so, you know, you're now looking for your Bitcoin wallet, thinking we need to get out of this. We don't have weeks to bring the business back. We need to, you know, we need to pay our people. We need to build parts. We need to do our work. And, you know, for many of these large companies that get hit by ransomware, you're talking, you know, millions of dollars per day that are being lost because you cannot bring your systems back up. It's kind of a, a no brainer for them to go and pay, but you know, there's problems as you probably know with paying, you know, you're supporting probably what's something that's very illegal. Um, you're encouraging more ransomware, you're out of pocket and your cyber, you know, insurance is going to go up regardless. Um, and you could be paying millions of dollars to these to these attackers. And by the way, these attackers typically know that you're insured and you have an insurance that is like $2 million and that's what they're gonna ask for. Like they are really, really sharp. And all of it is because backup is too slow to recover the files. And you really should be going back to, you know, previous versions of the files. And I, I think this, this problem is really uh, put, a, put a spotlight on the, the ineffectiveness of backup at scale, at the scale of any significant size file server. You know, once your file servers get to 100 terabytes, you're in this world of pain. Like you are not going to ever recover that in a reasonable amount of time from backup. And the backup companies don't want you to know about it. So they focus your attention on, we won't lose your data. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to get your data in time to be back in business. At a, at a reasonable, you know, non, non paying the Bitcoin, uh, you know, ransomware uh, time. So, 
So that's a, that's that, a very long answer. Yeah, no, it's a great answer though, and I'm curious for for businesses that find out that those defence methods that they they've relied and trusted upon for so many years, when they find out that they are ineffective, when they're hit by a ransomware attack, for, from what you're seeing. Are they still falling into the trap of reacting and paying those ransoms rather than the proactive approach of trying to stop them in the first place? Because, as you said a few moments ago, once you pay, you're almost adding yourself to a sucker list where you're going to have to keep paying, aren't you? You know, the thing is, I actually think paying is no longer going to be an option. That That is quickly becoming both. You know, I think that the, the, the cybersecurity companies that come in and if they're going to give you insurance, they require best practices that basically keep you from pain. Now, that includes a whole array of things, right? You have, you know, defend, you have the defense perimeter where you have like endpoint protection. I think, so I grew up in Venezuela. Very early on, you know, we had the Falklands uh, Island, uh, you know, war, which probably very few people in your podcast remember. But that was a really famous little war for for one event and one event only you know the the you know england sent a destroyer that just sat there on the shore intimidating the heck out of the poor you know the poor argentinians that were that were trying to get this island and you know our the the argentinian army dropped one missile one missile from one plane and that missile went straight at this British destroyer and sank it. And the, you know, the lesson from that is it doesn't matter how good your defensive systems are. Eventually, one missile, that's all it takes, one attacker to get through, one end user to compromise, you know, a VPN, to compromise the endpoint so that the attackers can all come in and you're in a world of pain. And what you have to think is. I need lines of defense all along this path to make it very difficult for them to spread once once the systems are compromised. So you need to divide your network. You need to make sure you know that you're protecting and creating independent domains for everything you have. And you know, I think a lot of organizations, big big companies, do most of these things. But that one percent, that one thing you're not doing, is the thing that's going to allow them to get in, and it's the thing that's going to create, you know, wreak havoc inside the organization. Um, you know, I think the file system, and by the way, ransomware is all about files. Like really, that's, they, they come in through, you know, an end user that's authenticated and they encrypt files. So it's, it's, a, it's a file story. And, you know, the last line of defense with files should be the file system. There's nothing else that can protect you. And when it comes to the file system, the, you know, like, you know, at our company, we're developing a lot of stuff to prevent things from happening to the file system first, but not even that can be foolproof. Eventually, something gets past all the preventive measures. And what happens is the files actually do get encrypted. And at that point, you need to be able to recover quickly. That's the trick. The trick is stop thinking about defensive lines at that point and think about how you recover from the actual attack. The attack is taking place. You've got millions of files compromised. And now what you need to do is you need to recover in a matter of seconds or minutes, not in a matter of days or weeks. And, you know, I like to, you know, I like to compare it to like T2, like Terminator. Like the thing that's so scary, the thing that makes that creature so scary is you can hit it, you can whack it, you can shoot it, and it reconstitutes itself. That's what you want your file system to look like. You want something that instantly, no matter how hard you hit it, comes back to a previous point in time when things were perfect, when things were healthy. And that's a different approach you know, than, than the backup approach. The backup approach basically says, your file system is compromised. We had nothing to do with that. We're the backup company. We're the backup back here. Why don't you start copying data from us back to your file server? We'll have you back in three months. Good luck. That's just broken. That's just so bad. And I've been at the IT game for a couple of years now, and I, I still remember the arguments when anything goes wrong, if, if, if the network could get blamed and the network guys say, don't go blaming the network, it's the systems. And the systems guys say, don't go right. blaming us, it's it's the app guy over here. Do those IT silos still exist? And, and with everyone not taking responsibility for recovery? You know, that's a great... 
That's yeah. a great comment. I actually believe that that's that's the big flaw in this whole thing. That's what that's why the, the market is kind of, you know, if you think about the the history of technologies, yeah. it's one of first there's a breakthrough, and that breakthrough exists as its own technology. Then that technology becomes commoditized. It becomes something that pretty not pretty much everyone has access to it, and then that technology is integrated into other technologies. Integration is key. The reason when you get real leverage out of technology is when you integrate aspects of different technologies into one system actually held together by the technology, not by people trying to stitch things together. The, the history of file servers and backup is exactly that. Like we started, you know, when, when NetApp introduced the concept of snapshots, it was a miracle. It was all of a sudden like a revolutionary thing. And then everyone got into the snapshot idea. But we still were backing up the file servers as an independent thing. And it was because the snapshots weren't good enough. There were only so many of them. You could only keep so many days. They really hurt utilization. It was very expensive to keep them. But then we, we got version file systems and we got cloud storage. Cloud storage is incredibly durable, incredibly resilient. You know, there's copies everywhere of your data. And, you know, version file systems can keep an infinite number of versions and they're immutable. They're unchangeable versions in the cloud. And the magic of that is that it's an integrated system. All of a sudden you have the file system protecting itself with immutable versions rather than two systems, a file server and backup, trying to protect your data. And... Because it's integrated, it's, first of all, it's much faster. It's much better technology. But also, there are no people to make mistakes. There are no access control problems. There is no corrupted backup problem. The functioning of the system, and this is, you know, this is one of my favorite observations. And I actually learned this from talking to guys from Pure Storage. It was something that they were adamant about. It's like, you know, don't design a system so that the day you're testing it is the day that there is a failure. That's too late, right? And even if you're doing tests, I, I mean, I know a lot. I spend my career now in IT. The most diligent IT managers, they will conduct testing, but they don't conduct testing at full scale ever. It's impractical. So if you have an organization with 500 file servers in 200 locations around the world, there is no way you're ever going to fail all those file servers at once and try to recover them. That's impractical. And but when you get hit with ransomware, you bet that's going to be the scenario. All those servers are going to be compromised. And you're going to find out at one moment, one dark Sunday morning when you're taking your kids to you know, play soccer. And then now you have to worry about that kind of recovery, that kind of scale. Um, so you know, design so that the everyday functioning of the system is testing itself and testing for the failure case every day. So, you know, when you version a version file system in the cloud, it, the system doesn't work without the versioning. And the versioning is running all the time. And you can see the versions, you can browse the versions. There's no special test operation that you need to do. And if you need a previous version, you can do it in one file, in a million files, and it takes the same amount of time. That's the beauty. That's, that is technology leverage. It's not like we're going to conduct this test, but we're only going to test a terabyte because more than that would be insane and everyone nods their head and they're like you know <laughs> they're not prepared and and you know it goes deeper than that neil because you know like i talk to a lot of analysts right and a lot of experts in all these things the backup experts they they have an entrenched position around the necessity for backup so when you talk to them about not needing backup they get all defensive they get all crazy you know they don't want people to stop doing backups because they are the experts in backup. The storage analysts, they're like, well, backup is not my problem. <laughs> you know? So because they're these silos, right? The ransomware guys are, are getting right through the crack in the middle between those two silos where no one is taking responsibility. I actually believe that the people that are the sanest in this whole world of silos are the security people. Because they have to look at the problem as an integrated problem. They, they don't care if you're the storage module or if you're the backup module or if you're Apple or Orange. They want a foolproof, absolutely good solution 
that has the preventive lines as well as takes the recovery time into account, which is a big thing the silo guys are not willing to accept, that their recovery times are unacceptable and therefore the solution is ultimately still vulnerable, even with all the line of defense systems and even with backup and the most durable, you know, CD-ROM type storage in the back of that backup. You're, you're done. You cannot recover in time if you have two systems worrying about your files. And we've talked about all the problems, challenges, and mistakes that you've seen people making. And I suspect we'll have techies listening to this podcast nodding in agreement throughout. So I suppose the biggest question here is, and it is a big one, is, is what should businesses be doing to protect themselves from a ransomware attack fully? Is there, is there anything you can advise around that or tips to leave uh, listeners on? Well, definitely come check out Masuni for sure, yeah. Neil. But it's it's a comprehensive, you know, problem. So you have to think about the problem from the very front door of your business. So you know, endpoint protection, you know, MFA. But you have to assume every one of those lines can be breached in some form. I mean, the cleverness of these attacks, the way they can simulate. You know, you would think that like MFA is incorruptible. It's mm -hmm. absolutely not true. Right? There are a dozen ways to compromise MFA. So you just have to assume we will get parts of our infrastructure compromised. That means you need detection. You need to be able to see it. And there are ways to see the patterns. And there are plenty of companies that are in that area. And you have to be able to isolate the problem. And then you have to have last lines of defense. You have to think about the problem, not just domain wise as a holistic thing, meaning the endpoints, the network, the servers, all of that stuff, but also holistically in terms of the stages, right? You're trying to prevent them. That's the first stage. Then you're trying to detect them. That's the second phase. Then if all that fails, you're trying to isolate them, isolate the problem. If that fails and assume it fails, assume it all, it all gets breached, you have to be able to recover swiftly. You have to have a recovery system at all levels blocks, files, everything that can guarantee that from an impenetrable copy of the data, from an immutable part of your data systems, you can actually come back in minutes, in hours, not in weeks or months, because then you're at the mercy of the ransomware attackers. And despite the uncertainty, the silos, and everything that we've mentioned today, what makes you hopeful about the future? Is it, we've talked about the problems, but things are getting better, right? They are. And, you know, it goes back to the beginning. Where I told you at the beginning. We're really good at creating problems that we can solve, and then that creates the next set of problems that we can solve. And the thing that gives me hope to all these things is the fact that everything has gone to software. So software companies that are, you know, when like at Nasuni, when we think about new features, the first thing we think about is what is the API to that whole system? Like what's going to be the interface, not just for us, but what's the interface so that we can connect to things like Sentinel, so that we can connect to other systems that are complementing our solution. I think our ability to build very large, complex software systems that can interact with each other and act as a whole, is a, it's, it's the only way, you know, big, control planes that actually are giving you full view, full control of massively complex environments and doing a ton of stuff with automation, not with people trying to duct tape from A to B. I think that's the, that's the future for all of it. And especially when you're thinking about cloud deployments, which many, many people are thinking about now, like full on cloud deployments, no data centers, nothing on prem, just everything running in the cloud. The cloud, again, offers this amazing vast canvas for really deploying software at scale and very complex systems that are all working together as opposed to silo, 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 silo. The, wherever there is a silo, either there is an inefficiency for the business being created or there's a security gap that can be exploited. You want to eliminate the silos. You want to connect all your systems and have full view, full control of the whole. 
Fantastic advice. And we began the podcast today talking about your origin story. So as we come full circle, I'm now going to ask, is there a song, piece of music, movie or book that has inspired, accompanied you or, or helped you in your career? Can you share your choice, possibly a story behind it as well? And uh, we'll leave the listeners on an inspirational note. How about Rocky getting hit again and again and again <laughs> and always coming back? That's a That's a good one. But, you know, I was thinking about that, you know, I, so I'll tell you uh, uh, um, a good moment for me. You know, we've all been so isolated. We're also tired of talking over Zoom and meeting yeah. virtually and all this stuff. And just as Omicron was becoming sort of a little scary, but not yet shutting things down again, I, I, I reached out to one of our partners, you know, one of our, our hyperscaler partners. And I said, why don't we grab dinner before the world shuts down? shuts down again let's just see each other we haven't seen each other in over a year let's just have dinner and and you know and so we went out and we were we're having dinner and we're talking you know the, the you know the thing that's been true about my career is the most meaningful relationships i have are all with people that are working on interesting things things that we're both curious about and the relationships are meaningful because our curiosity is kind of binding us uh and we we like talking about problems that we think we can solve and and we like the points of view and i've been stuck thinking about this problem for probably six months and you know as we are diving into our appetizers or whatnot there was something that he said that just made me think about it from a completely different angle and it was because my entire attention was on our conversation because it was so special to be talking to someone face to face and i thought That's the magic. Like, that's why we get together, you know, face to face. Like, you know, we don't get together to like, I don't know, maybe some people get together to play golf and kumbaya and all that stuff. But Mm -hmm. engineers, we get together to solve problems. And when we do that, it is spectacular. And and somehow, maybe it's just I'm old or whatnot, but it doesn't happen in Zoom. It doesn't happen, you know, good luck to Zuckerberg and the the metaverse and all this stuff. I just, I don't buy it. I actually think that there is a sort of multi-channel emotional passion that comes across when you're in front of people and when you're working on interesting stuff that is irreproducible. And, you know, thank God we still have that. And we're going to go back to that. I have, I have no doubt we will go back to having our face-to-face, you know, collaboration and, and big interesting projects will continue to be around forever. I completely agree with you on that. And I think one other thing that we often forget or we've missed during the pandemic is the role of serendipity. You know, those times you'd go to a coffee machine or a water cooler in the office and you'd get chatting to someone you've never spoken before in a completely different department and they'd have a problem and you might be working on a fix and then together you find out a different solution. That's where the magic happens, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. That training, and there's a lot of goodness to that. Well, I cannot thank you enough for coming back on the podcast. But before I let you go, could you remind everyone listening where they can find out more information about Nasuni, the work you're doing, how to contact your team, et cetera, and learn more about anything that we've talked about today? What's the best starting point? Absolutely. So come to our website. Our website has tons of information. Our marketing department has has been doing a terrific job uh, creating education material on all this ransomware stuff that we discuss here, Neil. and um, and we are absolutely happy to talk to you about it. And, you know, if you have file servers, you're worried about ransomware, you should definitely uh, come to our site and learn more about it. We'd be happy to to talk with you. Well, as I said at the very beginning, you know, ransomware attacks are continuing. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world at the moment. And traditional backup will be more widely exposed. We kind of know that for a fact. And it's inadequate for business continuity and minimizing disruption to businesses. So I urge anyone listening to check out cloud native global file systems that can make recovery in minutes possible not days or weeks so do check out the work that you're doing at nasuni but more than anything thank you for coming on and sharing your origin story as well and i promise you we won't leave it three years till we talk again thank you thanks neil cheers if it's taking an enterprise or organization two weeks to recover their files because they're following best practices and suddenly paying a ransomware feels like a good idea for business continuity, then guess what? Your model is broken. 
And prevention is no longer the name of the game. It's detection and most importantly, recovery. And exacerbating the problem are these IT silos that are still there and nobody wants to take responsibility for recovery and causing it to fall between the cracks. But over to you, this is an age-old problem in IT. How are you tackling the problem in your organisations? Do you have traditional backups? And will they be more widely exposed as being inadequate for business continuity? Whatever it is, I'd love to hear your experiences. So email me now, techblogwriter at outlook.com. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. But don't just hit the follow or connect uh, button. Send me a quick message too, so I know who you are and where you listen. That's the aim of this podcast, but I'll be back again tomorrow with another guest. But a big thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.